And now, let's join Ace Broadcaster Mamode Akuga as he takes us inside the Niger Delta. Hello out there and welcome to the program. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. I'm your regular host, Mamode Akuga. Today's package is dominated with issues surrounding the passage of the Petroleum Industry Bill, PIB. In our first two reports, we'll bring you events that transpired at the just-concluded public hearing organized by both chambers of the National Assembly, beginning with proceedings in the House of Representatives. Next on our lineup is a passionate appeal made by the Ibide Development Forum, IDF, to the federal government to complete a long-abandoned road project awarded several decades ago to ease transport and communication hiccups in the Ibide community, Isoko South local government area of Delta State. We will, in the course of our program, bring you a report on how to address increasing challenges of insecurity in the Niger Delta. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Niger's oil-rich region, we'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, determined to make a difference. Welcome back. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. In what appears to be a confirmation of the position of Senate President Ahmed Lawan that there are powerful forces within and outside the country working against the passage of the Petroleum Industry Bill, PIB, the just-concluded public hearing on the bill at the House of Representatives witnessed a setback as factional host communities engage in a free-for-all in what is generally viewed as a sponsored event. Correspondent Chika Abudazir reports that the factionalization of the host communities of Nigeria producing oil and gas, HOSCOM, is part of a grand plan to stop the PIB. By the grace of God, when we resume, we'll start work on the petroleum industry bill. There are people both within and outside the country who will work against it, but it's going to be the strength of our patriotism to pass it. Nigeria's Senate President, Ahmed Lawan, could not have been farther from the truth when last month he averred that there were attempts by powerful forces to kill the petroleum industry bill. On day two of the just-concluded public hearing at the House of Representatives, there was a curious disagreement between two factions of the host communities of Nigeria producing oil and gas, HOSTCOM, over who should make presentation on behalf of the body. The disagreement believed to have been orchestrated by the powerful forces the Senate president made reference to had degenerated into violence as leaders of the rival factions engaged in a physical combat. What I had been trying over the period of my tenure has been how to put them together and how to put them to um, uh, have a common ground, but it's not been easy. But on that, on the, at the Senate, I was able to manage them well in a manner that one of them presented and the other could not present, but he submitted his memoranda. And I tried to do this in the, when we came to the House, but um, I think it was still intractable. But by God's grace, I have an agreement our understanding of three of the three or four groups that they will meet with me in my office and they will now present a common position which is the position that will be adopted as the House of Representatives and the Senate goes to the respective states to take their position. It was also gathered that the fight between rival factions of HOSCOM was as a result of disagreements over the preferable percentage of equity shareholding to be reserved for host communities in the PIB. However, for discerning observers of proceedings during the public hearing organized by the House of Representatives, there's more to the fray than meets the eye as the PIB has been the subject of deep-seated interest and intrigues long before this time. 
on close consideration of what transpired in the hallowed chamber of the National Assembly last week, people are beginning to ask some salient questions. Who could have motivated the disagreement that resulted in a fight at the public hearing? Was it orchestrated by some forces operating behind the scene to prevent host communities from speaking with one voice and deny them their demand for 10% equity shareholding in the PIB? One-time Secretary General of the Ijo Youths Council, Emmanuel Bristol, who describes the entire scenario as stage-managed, insists that the factional leaders of HostCom do not represent the interest of host communities in the Niger Delta. It is not as though that they represent, they have the mandate of the oil-producing communities. They should have conducted themselves better. In analyzing the situation, some civil society organizations present at the public hearing had come to the conclusion that the factionalization of HostCom was sponsored by interest groups in Nigeria's petroleum industry to create disharmony among host communities in the Niger Delta and shortchange them in the next phase of operations in the oil and gas industry. They had viewed with askance the decision by the ad hoc committee on PIB to prevent them and host communities from making oral presentations during the public hearing. This public hearing was held based on two sets of regulations. In one breath, the chairman of the committee allowed the multinational companies, the government representative, and those they categorize as stake critical stakeholders to speak to their memo. But to now ask me, for example, some of us came from Lagos, from Akwaibom, and all over the country, to come here and just go and say, I adopt what I have already submitted. It is an injustice. It shows the level of disregard that this parliament has for host communities. So this is just a smokescreen. This is an attempt to deceive Nigerians that there was a public hearing. For 20 years, passage of the PIB, which is intended to transform Nigeria's ailing petroleum industry, has witnessed a huge setback on account of sabotage by unseen powerful forces. Expectedly, most Nigerians would want to understand the logic behind the grand conspiracy against the PIB. I think it's a problem of Nigerian politics. Everybody wants to have free access to the oil industry, oil and gas industry. Government uses it, those who are in power, uses it to empower themselves and do whatever they want to do with it. And they feel that if you have the right laws, they won't have access to the oil and gas industry vote. I think that's the politics that is setting us back. Fortunately, Nigeria's Senate President Ahmed Lawan has vowed that the Ninth Assembly would stop at nothing to break the jinx in the delayed passage of the PIB. For their part, host communities are expected to quickly sink their differences and come up with common positions on various aspects of the PIB to get a better deal in the next phase of operations in the oil and gas industry. This line of action has become expedient considering the little time available to stakeholders to make Nigeria's long-awaited Petroleum Industry Act a reality by the end of the first quarter of 2021. Inside the Niger Delta Representatives of host communities in the Niger Delta have demanded that adjustments be made to certain provisions of the Petroleum Industry Bill PIB to ensure their full participation in the oil and gas industry before it is finally passed into law. They made the demand at the just concluded two-day public hearing on the PIB organized by the Nigerian Senate. Correspondent Takenam Mifuri has details. Representatives of state governments and host communities turned out in their numbers at the just concluded two-day public hearing on the PIB at the Senate to present their positions on the role of oil-producing communities in a transformed petroleum industry. While the Delta state government demanded that contracts for protection of oil pipelines and other facilities be made the prerogative of host communities, River State called for expansion of the governing board of the proposed regulatory agency of the petroleum industry. In their proposed amendment to the various sections of the PIB, 
Other interest groups in the Niger Delta also demanded equitable participation in the petroleum industry. Hence, their call for an upward review of royalties agreeable to oil producing communities up to 10% in the proposed legislation. What they are having in the PIB bill is 2.5%, but we are agitating for 10%. You could take the, the, the Indorama model, you give our 10% ownership of the plant. In that case, there will be no crisis. The Indorama has found that the land is very That's why Indorama gave 5% to the government, 5% to the Abadwa people, and said that it's working. The delayed journey to enthrone a viable investment-friendly regulatory framework for Nigeria's petroleum industry began in the year 2000 when the PIB was first introduced in the National Assembly. To ensure its easier passage, the 8th National Assembly split it into four parts, namely the Petroleum Industry Governance Bill, Petroleum Industry Administration Bill, Petroleum Industry Fiscal Bill, and the Petroleum Host and Impacted Communities Bill. While the Petroleum Industry Governance Bill has been passed, it remains the first in a series of long-awaited legislations designed to reform the country's ailing oil and gas industry. In their presentation at the two-day public hearing on the PIB, some industry players underscored the need for accelerated passage of the PIB to ensure value addition and internalization of Nigeria's petroleum industry. If we actually unless you know the the, the value chain of the, the the entire value chain of the gas, of the gas downstream midstream you invest in the asset, we will have a better um, energy value chain in Nigeria. Gas flare commercialization started. The discourse started in 2016. Up till today, nothing has happened. We've not had anything. You know, so those are things we want to be incorporated into the bill. After withdrawing his assent to the PIB, President Muhammadu Buhari finally transmitted a harmonized version of the proposed legislation to the National Assembly in October last year. Nigeria's Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Timipri Silva, is optimistic that when it is finally passed, the envisaged regulatory law will transform Nigeria's energy sector to benefit all stakeholders. At the heart of this philosophy is the Obaraki aim to establish good governance, competitiveness, global best practice, and the ease of doing business within the petroleum sector. Speaking during the just-concluded public hearing on the Petroleum Industry Bill, Senate President Ahmed Lawan noted that the nation's federal lawmakers were determined to resist attempts by powerful forces operating within and outside the country's petroleum industry to kill the PIB. He, however, emphasized that it would take the collective efforts of all well-meaning Nigerians to have the bill passed by the end of the first quarter of 2021. And we believe that we can defy all those odds that militated against the passage of the bill previously. So we are going to work on this bill in the National Assembly to fortify it, to make it a legislation that will stand because of time. The passage of the PIB into law with the objective to transform Nigeria's oil and gas industry is a race against time. If the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is anything to go by, most countries of the world will no longer depend on fossil fuel for their energy consumption by the year 2030. This makes it imperative for the proposed Petroleum Industry Regulatory Act to become operational as soon as possible to enable Nigeria benefit optimally from the oil and gas industry and brace up for a post-oil economy. Inside the Niger Delta. Indigents of Igbide community in Isoko South local government area of Delta State have called on the federal government and its agencies to come to their aid with the completion of the long-abandoned Akuga Road, which provides the community direct access 
to the east-west road. Correspondent Akana Milfori reports that the call was made following the constant blockade of alternative routes in and out of the community by rival communities of Enwe and Emede as a result of communal clashes over land disputes. Construction work on the access route from Uzoro through Igbide to the east-west road commenced in 1982, as can be seen from the inscription on this culvert in Igbide. The project was, however, put on hold after the military took over the reins of government in 1983. Since that time, some 39 years ago, the Igbide people say successive governments have promised to complete the road project but have not lived up to their promise. Igbide is currently surrounded by three communities, Enwe, Emede and Olomoro, all of which provide access routes into Igbide. However, Igbide people say, apart from the Olomoro Road, which is in a state of disrepair, they suffer constant blockade along the Enwe and Emede axis at the slightest sign of communal dispute. The access road that leads to Igbide they are blocked, one is blocked at MED by the MED people, the other one is blocked by Enwe, who is our neighbor. So we only pass through the small patch, patch, patchment of road that pass through Lumuru to Igbide. That is the only way we are coming to Igbide right now. The Igbide people, through the Igbide Development Forum IDF, are now asking the federal government to, as a matter of urgency, come to their aid with the construction of the Igbide end of the road, a stretch of seven kilometers that terminates at the east-west road. A community that has 11 oil wells and a flow station has no access road for them to get out of the place. It's unbelievable. Known as Akuga Road, named after initiator of the project, the late Honorable Clement Akuga, a former member of the old Bendel State House of Assembly, the road was part of demands presented by the Isoko Development Union when it met with President Buhari in Aso Rock in 2018. Another road we mentioned to him that uh, uh, our late Papa Akuga initiated was the MED, Oteri Bide Uzere uh, Road, which he also said the Minister of, uh, Minister of Works will give attention to. Yes, the Minister of Work visited here in uh, 2018 and went to inspect the road. But up to now, nothing has been done. For six decades, oil has been mined in Igbide, yet the people say there is no fiscal presence of the federal government in their community. They say the construction of this road will at least give them a sense of belonging. From here to uh, Emedi, the road is bad. Olomo, the same thing. To Enwe, the same thing. So we are just staying without any development. My appeal is that either NDDC or the federal, other federal agencies should be committed to have to complete the access road so that the Yoruba Pokbo should be opened up where landlocked. After waiting to no end on the federal government to come to their aid, the Ibide Development Forum decided to embark on a self-help mission to at least reopen the abandoned road. Government is not listening to us, so nobody is listening to us. So we, the Ibidians, people of Ibidi, we want to take our salvation in our hands. We want to self-help, want to engage our self-help to get across to the east-west road. Matching their words with action, the Igbide Development Forum mobilized its members and commenced work to create their own direct access route. They did this by leasing a heavy-duty bulldozer equipment from the Delta State's own direct labor agency, DLA. However, upon commencement of construction on the road, persons suspected to belong to hostile neighboring communities that always use the access route through their community as leverage against Igbido people, set the bulldozer ablaze in a deliberate attempt to frustrate the efforts of the Igbide people to develop their own direct access to the east-west road. 39 years after it was abandoned, 
Igbide residents want the federal government to see to the immediate construction of the Akuga Road, which links their community directly to the East-West Road, for their collective security. They are also optimistic that the construction of the road will open up Igbide and its surrounding communities for increased socio-economic activities in the area. Inside the Niger Delta Heritage Bank Service Performance Respect Integrity Innovation Tenacity Excellence Heritage Bank Your Timeless Wealth Partner Azekiel Group Oil and Gas Dredging Power and Air Transportation Azekiel Group Petroleum Product Sufficiency Energy Sustainability and Infrastructure Development Nigerian authorities have been called upon to support and empower the traditional institution to effectively tackle the growing menace of insecurity in the Niger Delta. The call was made by participants at a one-day conference in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, organized to promote synergy among traditional rulers, security agencies, government officials, and civil society organizations. Correspondent Lovely Ofigo tells us more. In the last quarter of 2016, the Niger Delta Avengers entered into peace talks with the federal government and announced a ceasefire in their daily attacks on crude oil facilities in the Niger Delta. Since then, crude oil production in the Niger Delta has witnessed relative stability. Regrettably, the region has relapsed into another wave of insecurity with court-related activities, artisanal crude oil refining, kidnapping and sea piracy on the rise. After carrying out a study on the trends and patterns of the new wave of insecurity bedeviling the Niger Delta, organizers of the Port Harcourt Conference discovered that most of the violent crimes were perpetrated in local communities where traditional rulers hold sway as custodians of the people's customs and tradition. In their estimation, it would take the collaborative efforts of traditional rulers, security agencies, government officials and civil society organizations to stem the growing tide of insecurity in the Niger Delta. Our economy influences the way that uh, party politics goes. And so that's, you know, uh, dialectics and contradictions, you know, throw up new security situations such that you see the proliferation of core group, you see the changing dynamics of the security, I mean the security institution who are also involved in politics, you see also traditional rulers who are supposed to uh, not to be part of party politics are increasingly being used, either they are dethroned because they are not supportive of the, the ruling party in power or because they show some sympathies with the opposition party. So you see there are a whole complex dynamics that are at play in the Niger Delta, thrown up because of the particular economy of I mean, political economy of oil. At the conference, traditional rulers expressed their willingness to be part of the security architecture in the Niger Delta, but noted that they were disempowered by extant laws and conventional principles to assume a meaningful role in combating insecurity. Traditional rulers mediate between the people and the state enhancing national identity and resolving minor issues and providing an institutional safety valve for the inadequate state bureaucracies. If the national rulers will be very functional in helping to return peace in our region, then they should be given a legal backing. Nigeria's former police chief, Solomon Arase, who was an online participant at the conference, had expressed solidarity with the traditional rulers. He said to make community policing a reality in the Niger Delta and elsewhere in the country, security agencies must consult with local authorities. The Niger Delta is a very uh, peculiar place in terms of our internal security management. The issue of militancy, the issue of courtism, the issue of uh, kidnapping, all these are issues that if we are able to come together as a group, if the various state governors are able to subsume you know, their interests in the interest of the larger Niger Delta region, this issue we are talking about you know, can be resolved. 
Other participants at the conference blamed the new wave of insecurity on excessive militarization of the Niger Delta and the persistence of structural injustice in the region. This region is the area where economic viability comes up to sustain the economy of the country. Why are you not addressing their problems? You skew security operatives to your side. People that are from this area are not getting the benefits accruing from their area. The Niger Delta is militarized. Every village in the Niger Delta today has soldiers. Every oil installation has soldiers that are protecting the installation. The Nigerian state has remained insincere. They are taking so much from one region, eating it, not putting anything back to that region. That is the problem. Once Nigeria decides to begin to become sincere by being honest with the people of the Niger Delta, I can tell you that all security problems, and I mean it, every single security problem in this country will cease. At the end of the conference, participants collectively agreed that there was need for the federal government to devise a bottom-top approach to effectively deal with the increasing challenge of insecurity in the Niger Delta. They also canvassed increased support and possibly a constitutional role for traditional rulers to effectively combat the menace of violent crimes in local communities across the Niger Delta. Inside the Niger Delta and it's on that note, we'll draw the curtain on the program. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region, will be back same time, same station next week. Until then, you can follow us on our social media handles showing right now on your screen. Until next week, I am Mamode Akuga, thanking you for staying with us. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.